It has been a season of surprises. Favorites falling when we thought they would rise to glory. Underdogs killing it when we thought they had absolutely no chance. And here we are already nearing the end of the group stage and we have some decisions to be made today. A few teams with a chance over the course of this weekend to secure that first place spot and get themselves a first round bye into our playoffs. Hello and welcome. I'm Rich Slayton joining me as always, my friend Andrew Guy for this great weekend of Clash Royale League, the best in Clash Royale esports. It's going to be a crazy one. This group stage has been, as I said before, nothing short of intense and surprising and wild. And now we're at a stage where already some teams might get that first round by, and we're going to see a shot at that today. Andrew, I can't wait to get started. It's going to be a crazy Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited to be here, man. Two squads at 2-0, and 2-0, two oh, and 2. Very, very different stories for all four teams coming out. And uh, I'm sure you guys are probably hanging out on YouTube, right? That's the place to watch us. Make sure you're subscribed. Turn on those notifications. We go live every Saturday and Sunday at 10 a.m. on the West, 1 p.m. on the East. And turning on the notifications is the best way to make sure that you're here with us every single time that we go live. And Rich and I are going to do our best to maybe try and say hi to a couple of you guys in chat today. Maybe, if you're lucky. We'll see. Uh, another way to say hi to us is on Twitter, at Esports Royale EN. There's a poll up there right now. You can vote on the matches that are happening today. But Rich and I also have Twitters. You can follow me at Andrew Guy. You can follow him at Rich Slayton. There's a lot of CR content on all of our pages. So make sure you're following all of us if you want to keep up to date. Lastly, Fantasy Royale. I almost didn't confirm my team again today, but I made sure that I did. I went back. I locked them in. I'm going to get my 1,000 gems. I'm not doing great. I, I didn't set my lineup last week. I think I'm at 26 crowns, so I think I can still turn things around. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling really good about it, but those lineups got to be set. Top four players, most crowns. Feeling good. Feeling good. If you're seeing the look on my face, it's because uh, Andrew keeps forgetting to set his lineup and still has more crowns than me somehow. So we've been going back and forth on that one, but... A lot of back and forth this weekend. Starting things off today, two undefeated squads. Dignitas actually with a chance to clinch first place in the group with a win over Tribe today. Tribe would not necessarily secure though. We'll talk about that more later. And then two teams at the bottom, Team Queso and Pain Gaming, both 0-2. Neither out of it yet, neither out of it with a loss, but a very important one today. Andrew. Yeah, yeah. And then tomorrow, Chivas Esports going up against CRB. Cream actually still in a position to take first, as you were just mentioning, but again, there's a lot more that go behind that. Chivas Esports needs to get a W. Will it happen, or will they end their season 0-4? The big goose egg. Following that, Space Station Gaming going up against Misfits. Space Station looking to go perfect. We'll see if that is going to continue on here tomorrow. Yeah, Andrew, that's got to be the hope for everyone there in Group B, I yeah. think. Other than Misfits, obviously. Misfits and Space Station, that's a first place match to end things out on Saturday or on Sunday. But if Space Station wins and Misfits goes to 2-1, and one, literally anybody in that Group B can make those two spots for playoffs. So it makes things really, really tight on that side. So you know the rest of that Group B will be looking at that very, very closely. But Andrew, today we have more important business right in front of us. Tribe Gaming, 2-0, undefeated. Dignitas, the first pick overall in the draft, 2-0, undefeated. And, you know, we've tried to make predictions in the past, but, buddy, I don't know if I can Yeah, I, I have no idea who's going to come out on top today, but one thing we do know is that the sets have been radically different for these squads. Tribe has been basically unstoppable, whereas Dignitas has bounced back in King of the Hill time and time again. But first, introducing Tribe Gaming, the blue squad today, Azilis and Buffmack will be your 2v2 duo, most likely. Jupiter King has yet to drop a game in the 1v1 set, and because of those three, we have not seen TNT yet. He hasn't actually been needed, so I'm sure he's dying to get out there, but it must feel great for the coach and the roster of Tribe to just be hanging Hanging out, playing these three guys, getting TNT all the reps that he needs, but showing absolutely nothing to the competition. Yeah, that's going to be big for them in the long stretch, especially if they continue on this winning streak and into playoffs. On the other side, Dignitas, the underdog, 
undefeated. And the big story here has been the gameplay of Flash, currently the number one player in Clash Royale League West. Undefeated at 7-0. Seven, oh. seven wins, no losses. So Flash having a career season here in the spring of 2020. But Andrew, the big question will be, what do they do in the 1v1? Flash and Cody Go have been great in 2v2. Bale, the young star from OCL, has not put it together yet. Is today the day they put Lince in that set? We'll find out after the 2 Yeah, I mean, 100% yes. They need to move Bale out and put Lince in because things are not working. You talk about 2v2, and it's been unstoppable on both sides. You see Azealia's and Buff coming out banning Giant Skeleton. Lince, and, or I mean, excuse me, Cody going Flash coming out for... Dignitas with the Prince ban, but 2v2 for both these squads has been unbelievable. Only one game has been lost between both of these teams, and that was by Tribe. Otherwise, they've been absolutely perfect. But when you look at the 1v1, that's when the wheels start to fall off for Dignitas. And of course, that one game loss was last week when Tribe opened up 2v2 with Elixir Golem in the duo set. Something none of us thought we were going to see, and talked a little bit with Buff Mac afterwards and he said that really they shouldn't have run it in game number two. They were a bit overconfident and they got caught out. I can't imagine they will be overconfident today in this match against Cody going flash. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you, my friend. So here we go. Looks like we got game number one coming at you. Cody go and flash top of your screen. Azili's and Buff Mac at the bottom. And as you can see, minor wall breakers for Dignitas in this opening Yeah, set. minor wall breakers and wall breakers connecting. Bats get a couple hits in there, and now we see another aggressive drop at the river of those wall breakers. Goblin Cage to pick up the wall breakers will probably be a big part of it. Obviously a log with a minor in front of the wall breakers, not going to get the wall breakers off the board. So we'll see what different versions of that Ooh. defense they go. And a missed tornado by Flash and Cody go. That's going to hurt them Yeah, in the you hate run. to see it. You hate to see the missed pull there. And here we go. Ram Rider push on the left. Pekka up front. He was behind. This should be a Ram Rider connection. There it is. Yeah, she taps the tower, but now healthy Mega Knight going the opposite direction. And now wall breakers on the right hand side. No cage in cycle for the moment. One wall breaker does connect 1425 on the right hand side of the board with a minute 15. Yeah, Zillies and Buff having a lot of difficulty stopping these wall breakers in single elixir. We'll see what happens here in the next 10 seconds, but still barely in the lead with that top right hand tower. That's great rocket value, my friend. Log does save a little. Yeah, log saves a little bit more damage. 1725, 1275 right hand side for Flash and Cody go 1425. So. Despite the effort of Dignitas right now, still behind against Tribe Gaming, who have been finding a home with this P.E.K.K.A. Mega Knight Ram Rider deck. Wallbreaker's left-hand side. Snowball will clean that up easily. Ooh, a late, late snowball there. One Wallbreaker does connect, so 1184 top right, 1733 bottom left, which is the tower that Cody Go and Flash seem to be going after. Lightning comes in. That's a nice lightning. 1184 right hand side, final 20 seconds. Ram Rider not going to connect this time, and Miner going to town on the right hand lane. Mega Knight does come down to stop the mini P.E.K.K.A. Mega Knight push. But look at this, Baby Dragon yeah. Ram Rider left hand side, tower down. This should be it. Tribe should be taking game number one. I mean, that Ram Rider is still at completely full health. So this becomes a situation where there's a moment where they just got caught out by not having the elixir in hand. Azilis and Buffmack recognize it. They stay heavy on the offensive, and Cody Go and Flash have nothing to put there on the left-hand side because they needed to go aggressive on the right to try to take that tower. It just wasn't happening. And Azilis remains the win rate leader overall in 2v2 amongst players with 10 or more games, moving his record to 25 and nine, so firmly in the mid 70s in his overall 2v2 win rate. He has, over the last year and a half, become the premier 2v2 player in all of CRL. And you see here Cody go, he's one holding the Inferno Tower. He dropped it three times, but that lightning coupled with the dual Ram Riders with a tank up front, the E was behind, made it really, really difficult to stop those Ram pushes, especially when, especially when they started cycling the Ram pushes, which you'll see a lot with win conditions, right? Whether it's Royal Giants, Lava Hounds, Golems, Ram Riders, Graveyards, when you start getting that cycle and, and you're going hard on offense, it can be really difficult for your opponents to keep up. 
So here we go on the right hand side, setting up with the, the big Pekka Lumberjack. And it turns out that just the defense on the left hand side, Andrew, was what stole the game because Lightning takes the Musketeer off the board, clears the way for this E Wiz and Baby Dragon yep. on the left hand side. And Dignitas spending so much attention on the right, they kind of lost track of what was happening over there with the Ram Rider and the Baby yeah, Dragon. Yeah, completely. And they also had a really odd moment at the very beginning of this sequence where they dropped those wall breakers right into the E Wiz and the Baby Dragon. After that was committed, then you saw Azilius and Buffmack drop down the Ram Rider behind that because they saw that overcommitment on Elixir. And they're like, look, if they just spent that right here, they got nothing. I mean, wall breakers, they're not kiting anything. They're not getting any damage on the tower. They're not providing any defensive utility. They go, all right, well, let's, let's lean to this push a little bit more because we have extra Elixir to defend on the right now that they don't have to commit to offense. So I think that was just a really small misplay, but it made those final moments basically impossible to come back from for Dignitas. When you make a very good point, Andrew, about the recognition by Tribe Gaming, noticing, and you said this, if they're dropping the wall breakers like that in that position, it means they have nothing else to work with on yep. this side. Let's double down on it. And as you saw, and as you said, they went and got it done. Not to mention the, the tornado, the missed King Tower activation pull early. So that's five elixir over the course of the entire match, which... Uh, you know, it seems small, but those small things have ripple effects, and here we are, game number one going to Tribe, heading into game number two with the set advantage. Yeah, completely. I mean, you and I have talked about cascading mistakes for season after season after season, and in 2v2, you know, it's not quite a double drop, but wasting five elixir on those things is really devastating. It really, really is, and that early missed tornado pull is something you always wish you can get back, and, and I'd say 80% of the time when we see teams miss tornado pulls in 2v2, they probably end up losing that game. So you see Flash and Cody go look at feeling like they probably had it but just made a couple of mistakes. So going back to the same idea, they did have their moments. Azelius and Buffmax switching things up here with the Cannon Cart in game number two. Yeah, you know, now Cannon Cart's going to provide utility to stop those wall breakers if it becomes a building, you know, as you see there on the right hand side. Also, they got the log, the goblin cage, the heal spirit, the tornado. They have a lot of great utility here. Pekka connects on the right hand side. They have a lot of great utility to stop the wall breakers. So we'll see how much they end up spending and doubling down on offense. Yeah, this has been a rough opening sequence, though, for Tribe. Spending the NATO to stop the wall breakers, but. Free pancakes from the mini yeah. Pekka. Now, though, a nice golem cannon cart push going the opposite yeah, direction. Yeah, they did a great job of holding onto their elixir for just long enough to make sure that they would have that lightning able to cast. They knew, by the way, that their opponents were playing their defense so lax on the right-hand side and going heavy on the left, that they were most likely going to play a large building. So that lightning played paid off a lot. Skeletons come down to protect the magic archer, but a, cle a cheeky heal spirit from Azili's helps the brawler get the magic archer off the board. Minute 10 left, about to go into double elixir time. Right now, it is Cody Go and Flash overall with the lead, but a troublesome tower. And as we go into double elixir, we'll see if this golem pressure starts to get too much for Dignitas. Yeah, I know we've seen it a lot. Golems coming back in double elixir and <clears throat> Azilas and Buff doing the right thing. They, they gotta lean into these defenses and see if they can get counter pushes down. The problem is, is with their towers at where they are, that's the right moment to drop the golem. That's actually the perfect moment for them because they are already committing so much to the left hand lane with that Mega Knight Plus. Two cannon carts in the middle. You gotta wonder if that was an intentional or a double drop and they yeah. both move ahead of the golem. So it seems like a bit of a miscommunication here maybe from Azelius and Buffmack. But now they need to use that mistake to their advantage. Use that cannon cart to play some defense on your ground unit and see if you can really help out. And that lightning really going to do a good job here. Night Witch still getting tanked for. Baby Dragon, Dark Prince, and oh, a whole lot yeah. on the right hand side. Plus those bats being tanked for on the left. Take a look at this, Andrew. This is going to be two towers down. Azelius and Buffmack roar from behind in the final moments and clear out Just the Just completely overwhelmed, overspending on defense, not having the right options, or not having the right responses, and of course that dual lane pressure. So two up, two down quick for Azilis and Buff, and... and it just felt like Cody Go and Flash mismanaged defenses so, like, very, very minutely throughout the game. But again, cascading, adding it up, snowball downhill, all those things come together in the final minutes, seconds, actually. And Tribe takes two towers, which is very important. I'm very curious about that double cannon cart drop that we saw, if that was... 
Uh, you know, you, you see something like that and you think maybe someone called Cannon Cart and they both dropped it accidentally. Ended up working out in their favor in the long run, so I'm very curious to see if we can get some info from them on that later in the day. Maybe they'll chime in on Twitter and tell us if that was intentional or a mistake. Either way, doesn't matter. Worked out well. 2 and 0. Oh, Azalea's and Buffmat continue to be superb in this 2v2 Yeah, set. I mean, you know, I, I honestly, I, I'm in the same boat. I want to hear what they have to say about it, but if I'm just speculating, it does feel like a misplay that they turned around and were able to turn into a good offensive push. That way, they were able to just back up the golem with the Night Witch because they didn't have to defend the Night Witch with any other units. Like, they didn't have to drop anything behind it to help clean up anything on the ground, anything in the air, because the Night Witch was there, the bats were spawning, and you knew when the Night Witch went down, those bats were going to help the Golem out. So that Cannon Cart double play, or that double drop, yes, a lot of elixir spent, but they had a nice bit of defense on the ground. So there you see the moment we're talking about. A great log comes in, doesn't actually take off both Cannon Carts. So the first one crosses the river, right? And that's soaking up the Inferno Tower damage, which is a huge part of the success of this push. Well, then you also take a look at the, the capitalization on the right-hand side when they realize a little bit of pressure on the right. Two baby dragons, Dark Prince, throw the rage down, force Dig to start making decisions hastily in that moment. And we saw, as soon as they're trying to focus, how do we stop this huge raged-up push on the right-hand side? Golemites and two bats just working on the left-hand side. And at that point, Dig was caught between a rock, a hard place, and a very, very raged-up Dark Prince. GG, well-played, 2-0 set for Yeah, Trap. and that was also another moment you saw at the very end, something that we talked about at the beginning of that game, was that those cannon cards coming in, when they do go down, and when those wheels come off, they do become buildings. And you saw at the very final seconds, Dignitas was going for the kill. They were going for anything they could, and they sent two wall breakers right into a downed cannon cart. GG, well played, wasted elixir, and that is a very dominant 2v2 set from a squad that has been dominant throughout. Now, you look at Dignitas, they haven't even won a 2v2 set yet. They've only won one game, in, or excuse me, in 1v1, not 2v2, excuse me. Yeah, and, and I, I, that's where I was going to go with this next part, Andrew, is that you have Tribe Gaming's Jupiter King, who's absolutely cracked, yeah. who was phenomenal throughout No Tilt League Special Edition, who's been phenomenal here. And I don't care if you're sending out Linsei, or, and it is Linsei, it's not Bail this time, so we were right with that speculation. Mm -hmm. I don't care which one you send out. For either one, beating Jupiter King is a very, very tall Yeah, order. so here we go. Jupiter King going up against Linsei, and I see here in the chat... Someone's saying, imagine people who took Azealia's and Buff Mac on fantasy teams. Yeah, yeah, good for you guys. I, I, uh, I have one of them. <laughs> Miner goes in, picked up by the Prince. Bats will get that chunk down a little bit, but might still have enough health that Jupiter does have to respond, and he does with the Spear Goblins. Yep. So maybe we'll see Mortar here, but maybe we'll see a combination of a, a slew of other things that we've seen, and definitely not going to be now at this point. You'd say cycles musky to the right hand side. Poison by just a hair doesn't activate King Tower. That was just perfectly placed and uh, living dangerously is the young tribe star. Feeling saucy today. Will someone take a game off Jupiter King today? That is the million dollar question. Yeah, uh, it's it's been difficult to do. He has not given up very many games throughout his very short professional career. Went 23 and 10 in the No-Till League Special Edition. And oh yeah, undefeated so far here in Seattle. Yeah, and that's over Anaban and Igor that he has 4-0'd. So Jupiter King looking perfect. And I guarantee you that the amount that he has accomplished over the last few months puts a ton of pressure on his opponents. Keep in mind, Lin says no slouch, 55% win rate lifetime in CRL head-to-head -head gameplay, combining both King of the Hill and 1v1. But when a guy's playing with the confidence and skill that Jupiter is, it's just going to be challenging. So we'll see. Can he take a game off him and can he take the set off him? Dig needs Lin to come through big here as we move into the final moments of single and into double elixir time. So high bats there. You see the ice golem come to cash him. Prince not going to do much work here. Inferno still on the board and... Jupiter King running that Minor Prince Poison deck that we've seen so many times in different seasons. Lince going to have to figure out a way to break through, create enough pressure to get this Ram Rider on tower with the Log and, of course, the Inferno Tower in the way. Well, Prince and Log definitely going to help out as well, and you see a nice counter here. Ram Rider not going to get to tower this time Minor. around. The big question here is... Oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, the Prince not going to get there. Yeah, Miner does not come in with the Prince set up in the back. And as you said, it's going to be an be interesting question of how Lindsay can set up something big enough to break through. And it's going to be pushes like this that we're seeing, right? It's going to be pushes that have a lot of heavy tanks up front that then Lindsay can go, all right, there's no way he kills both of these tanks before the Ram Rider gets at least one connection. So we'll see how much of that he can actually do. And the problem here is it's really tough for Lindsay to create a lot of opposite lane pressure because his deck is so heavy and it's so easy for Jupiter to get a little bit of damage on tower. So here we go. Mega Knight. Oh, Ram Rider sneaks in front, though. That is not what Lindsay wanted. Yeah, those bats were nice, but the sequence didn't get quite right. We'll see if he goes for an Ice Golem to pick up high here. Miner goes to the Musketeer and Ice Golem to distract at the bottom. That Beautiful was... defensive sequence there by Jupiter. Yeah, wow. We need to clip that out. Now we see here the Prince still does get a couple hits in, which is massive, massive. You talk about playing Miner, Control, Poison, Ever. It's all about chip damage. And just then with that Prince, Lince even things up, which makes it a lot more difficult for Jupiter to stay in the lead. And you see yeah. this time Jupiter predicting the bats coming in with the spears on the left-hand side. So a nice pickup and just trying to protect the Inferno Tower long enough that it can do its work. So here's the thing that's really interesting about the matchup that we're in right now is you can see that there's two very different styles of play. Jupiter King has to execute magnificent small interactions time after time after time here on defense and make positive elixir trades because of the huge beatdown ability of this deck from Lince. Whereas Lince is just building up massive pushes, letting them cross the river and taking damage Minor. where he can. Sorry, sorry to interrupt there for a second, Andrew. I thought Lince, I thought Jupiter was about to go for something very, very fancy. You saw he almost got enough around the back to make room for that Prince. This deck has some exciting outplay options, but wow. now a second Mega Knight down, Lince pouring it on. Yeah, that Inferno Tower, though, causing a lot of trouble here for Lince. Zap doesn't come in in time. Second Inferno Tower goes down, and another Miner on Tower. Jupiter King is playing this perfect. And the log, just the, the little yep. itty-bitty log work he's getting out, and this is going to be... Most likely a win for Jupiter, barring something crazy happening. No, not enough time. That's going to be a GG well played. Jupiter King remains perfect so far on a CRL campaign. And for those of you playing fantasy, a last second crown just to put the icing on the cake. I may or may not have added him to my lineup. Just saying, just saying. Uh, but, <laughs> wow, yeah, I, I, I'm so happy you mentioned the log work because, yes, it's it's pretty easy for everyone to look at the interactions that are happening on his side of the board defensively and go, wow, okay, that's some of the best defensive plays I've ever seen with this deck. But getting logs in early, and you saw it every single time he had a chance to slow the stun, or excuse me, the charge on the Prince or the charge on the Ram Rider, he would do it high so that then he could get a little bit of chip on that tower. And every single one of those logs added up so he could take that crown at the very, very end. And it's those small plays that make him the best head-to-head -head player in CRL 2020 in the West right now. It's been so unbelievably impressive, and you're talking about the small plays. Jupiter certainly understands rotation, understands matchup, but the, these top young players, whether it be Igor, Jupiter, Lapo, Ruben, it's all about micro, and that's what it's been with Jupiter top to bottom. And this was the sequence that Lince went for over and over again, trying to distract that Inferno Tower with the high bats. And just, again, talking about that log work, just enough to keep it out, and this was beautiful. Yeah. You and I both love this. The Miner goes to the Musketeer to take her off the board, and the Ice Golem goes between the Mega Knight and Prince to protect the Miner playing defense on the Muskie. Prince still connects for a little bit, but that sequence was a game saver for Jupiter. Yeah, and I think, honestly, the only reason it wasn't perfect, Rich, because I think the better drop is you go Ice Golem high, Miner on top of the Prince. That way the Miner's doing a little bit of damage to the Prince while he's still alive. Maybe he doesn't get those hits at the end, but I guarantee you it was a cycle thing for Jupiter King where he had to play the Miner first and then the Ice Golem. And as you said, that's as good as it gets. He takes two Prince hits. That's basically the only moment where Lince showed that he might be able to come back in this. Otherwise, it was those logs, like that log after log after log coming in getting poison value where he can high and tight like we saw early on on top of the musketeer or as you see here getting it down as fast as he can that's why he's playing it on that lowest left tile rich it's so those ticks come in as fast as possible so much fun to watch uh, I've been playing Minor Prince Spears this season, so a few note, a little bit of note-taking over <laughs> on my side. I have to re-watch that one.
to get some tips of how the pros do it best. So here we go. Tribe Gaming, uh, are you shocked at all, Andrew? One game away from yet another 4-0 clean sweep? I mean, here's here's what I have to say is I, I am not surprised at all but I didn't want to sleep on Dignitas. They came into this 2-0. and They were playing so well in the 2v2, but I had a really, really strong feeling that the 1v1 set was going to be the moment where Tribe kind of separated themselves because, yes, Dignitas has been able to come back and have some amazing King of the Hill victories, but struggling in this 1v1 as much as they have against this team, I just don't think it's going to bring you the W at the end of three sets. Well, let's see if Lince can win two in a row and send us to King of the Hill where... They have had some heroic performances so far. First, though, got to stop the almost unstoppable Jupiter King. Still has yet to drop a game. CRL record now a clean 100% at 5-0. and oh. So Jupiter King plays the Magic Archer, gets poisoned off. Fireball in response to the Muskie on the opposite side. He's playing those as high and as quickly as he can so that he's never, ever leaking any elixir. And heal spirit behind, so maybe we're going with uh, Royal Hogs here from Jupiter. And you see here, Ice Golem going to get some death damage on that tower, already up by about 150 damage here, so very small, but that's what changed the last game that we saw. Every single one of those connections. The Ice Golem blowing up, the log coming in, heal spirits connecting. Bar Barrel penetrates, picked up yeah. by the mini P.E.K.K.A. And Lince one step ahead, and then Jupiter says, no, I'm actually Yeah, I was going to say, yep, nope, Jupiter is living in the future. Great drop by the mini P.E.K.K.A. Allows that magic archer to get that hit. There you go. That heal spirit baits out the bats. Log come in. These things are adding up. It felt like just a second ago I said it was 150. Now it's almost 400, Rich. And it's been by these very, very small blows here and there. Lince, personal best, 8,089 on ladder. Jupiter King, 8,573. You might say, hey, they're both 8K, but 8,000 versus 8.5. It's a, not an insignificant difference up at that level of ladder. High score? What does new high score mean? Did I break it? <laughs> Final minute of regulation play. Double elixir flowing Jupiter. Sets up both Hunter and Magic Archer to the left-hand lane. Lince so far has not found a real way to break into the second level. And a nice fireball to get the Musketeer off the board with And them. I love what Jupiter King has done so far with his Heal Spirit. Now you see the very first time the Heal Spirit's being used in conjunction with the Royal Hogs. But every other time it's been dropped, it's made a positive one trade for him. By Lince either having to zap, bar barrel, or bat. And that's a nice Ice Golem Mini P.E.K.K.A. combination. Keeps the, mag the, the Mega Knight turned the wrong way. Mini P.E.K.K.A. takes care of the Ram Rider. And now it's a mountain rolling the opposite yep, direction. mountain rolling the opposite direction. Hogs left. Mini P.E.K.K.A. Hog and Hunter top right. Yes, it was defended well. But if you look at the Elixir, Jupiter King is in a great spot. Lince in a lot of trouble. Ice Golem easily kites, and look at that. Musketeer taken down. A little more chip damage here by the log. Final minute, 50 seconds remaining. Let's say it's kind of way past the defense. I mean, this is, this is what you would call putting on a clinic right now. Now, yes, again, things can change in the drop of a split, or in a split second, drop of a dime, but right now, Jupiter King putting on a clinic in the 1v1 set. Ram Rider high. Mini P.E.K.K.A. should be available, and there you go. And this is the big thing, Andrew. Every time that Jupiter King plays defense, it turns into a very healthy counter push. Yeah. Almost every, this is the first really healthy counter push Lince has had uh, from his defensive methods. Right, and it was at what, at what expense though? You know, he had to allow that entire collection of Royal Hogs, that whole group, the Hog Army, as we like to call it, to connect on that right-hand side, bringing that tower down to 493 HP, where both of Jupiter King's towers are above 2K. For the first time now, Lince is starting to get a little bit ahead on Elixir, just as we're talking about that one. Forced Jupiter to spend quite a bit on the right-hand side. Mm. Mega Knight, Prince, and Musky, but a decent bit of fireball oh. damage. This is a big push on the right-hand yeah, lane, though, Yeah, a very Andrew. big push. A great recognition of mistakes there by Lince. Jupiter King in a ton of trouble. He does get the Ice Golem down with that Hunter behind. Will it be enough? Wow. 
second Prince, and now Mini Pekka does pick up. But again, Lince way ahead on Elixir. Fireball cycling a little bit, 292, not quite in range to cycle this Ooh. thing out yet. And he misses final 15 the seconds. Ice to come down to keep that Hunter alive. Hunter is back around. This has been a great comeback here for Lince, but it's not going to be enough. The pressure is on. Fireball gets down. Log get the Musketeer out of the way, and there you go. Tribe Gaming, 3-0 on the season. Jupiter King, 6-0 in the 1v1 set. This is what everyone expected. They are playing almost at a perfect and Rich, they're, they're, they're taking your catchphrase here on YouTube with a bunch of wows. <laughs> because, I mean, what else can you say about the guy? He, he looked like he was falling, like it looked like it was about to fall apart for Jupiter King. It looked like he'd made a couple too many mistakes on defense, not spending his elixir efficiently enough, and Lince recognized it, and he poured it on. But I think you and I both recognized that moment where Jupiter King was able to come above water when he got that mini Pekka back down in front of the hunter to stop that prince. And then from that moment, Jupiter King was back in the driver's seat. Uh, I think there's one more thing you can say, Andrew, is Jupiter King is correct. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and take a look at that defense from Jupiter here at the end. I mean, this was one of those moments where it really felt like Lince might steal game number two and send us to a third, but somehow between the log fireball action, able to hold on and my word, Andrew, looking at this again, I really can't believe well, it. Lince did a great job of picking apart the beginning, and that's why Jupiter struggled so much. You saw what Jupiter did. He went Ice Golem right, Heal Spirit left, uh, and with the low Hunter, but Lince was ready for both those units. Now, if if Jupiter King had switched those two, and we had the Heal Spirit there, uh, excuse me, the Ice Golem in place of the Heal Spirit, that Musketeer wouldn't have done as much damage. He wouldn't have taken as much here at the river, but Lince did an excellent job of recognizing how Jupiter was playing defense, and he picked it apart for a moment. But unfortunately for him, it was just not enough. And there you see our winners for match number one, Tribe Gaming. And again, the same same story as in the, the second verse, same as the first, Andrew. The log work of Jupiter yes. King. You know, not always working. Something that, uh, that some log players will do or some people will do uh, when they're first learning about log is they always want to try to play it at the bridge and get a little bit of damage on a troop and a little bit of chip damage. Jupiter recognized in both of these games when it was more appropriate to play the log completely defensively, not worry about getting chip damage, and that might have been the biggest difference here in this game, continuously knocking back, resetting, buying some time for cycle, and in the end, getting the victory. Yeah, and you saw he was doing the correct thing every single time that he could fireball that musketeer and get damage on the princess tower, then he knew when his log would come in, not only would he get a little bit of chip damage, slow everything down, knock back the ram rider and the prince, but he would also take the musketeer off the board so putting those things together time and time again to get chip damage and to deal with the highest dps range unit jupiter king again put on a clinic had those games in control for i'd say 98 percent of those two games so this is an interesting situation we're in now andrew because with tribe beating dignitas now it really comes down to tribe and cream if cream can beat chivas tomorrow then Cream could have a chance at beating Tribe. We could come to a three-way tie for first place based on our final weekend of gameplay. Oh. It's possible. Of Andrew. course it is. Of course it is. And I cannot wait to talk through those tiebreakers. But first, we got to go to two squads that have yet to find a victory yet. Team Queso and Pain Gaming, both at 0-2 and, and Group B, looking to find that first W today. All right. We'll be back in just five minutes. Don't go anywhere.
And welcome back to part two of our beautiful Saturday series. And yeah, that first one might have been pretty quick, but don't worry, there's more Clash Royale League coming at you right now. We just saw perfection. Yeah. That's what we just saw. It was beautiful. Even with some slight slip-ups in game two, Tribe Gaming was like, yeah, but no, 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 we're absolutely fine. On the other side, maybe some teams with a bit more pressure on both of their shoulders. Two teams both at 0-2, two, two teams desperately in need of a win to stay relevant. Yeah, right well, now. what's crazy about Pain and Queso is that they're both 0-2, but when I was setting my fantasy lineup today, I was looking at crowns. Two very different stories in what's happened in their games. Now, yes, but they're both 0-2. Queso has only taken three crowns in two matches. Pain on the other side of it, 23 combined as a team, and they're still 0-2. So what that tells me is there's a lot of trouble over for the cheesy ones, but that Pain Gaming is putting a lot together but not able to close things out. You look at 23 crowns and you wonder, how is this possible you guys haven't picked up at least one game? Yeah, Pain's come close but hasn't been able to close it out in the <laughs> end. On the other side with Queso, what's interesting is they were so dominant during No Tilt League Special Edition, and I do believe that that Double King of the Hill format, being able to lean on Ruben or JP alternately, yeah. just letting the two of them both run wild, if one's not having a great day, the other one picks up, I think that was that benefited them a lot. Here today with Team Queso, you know, if you have an off two games in 1v1, that's GG well played, and that's what we've seen so far from this big Spanish yeah, team. Yeah, so coming out for the cheesy ones today, and I'm hoping they switch something up in their 2v2 because that's where they've really been struggling. They have not picked up, a, they haven't picked up a set yet, but 2v2, they haven't won a game. Benihu, Kuchiku, I am JP and Ruben. They've been changing things up a lot, so I'm very curious to see what to come out today in that 2v2, if they can pick up that first game, and then of course who they're going to bring out in that solo spot. It was Ruben in the first one, JP in the second. Yeah, and that's been interesting about Team K, so we'll talk more about their history of rotating lineups in a minute. On the other side, Pain Gaming, the all-Brazilian squad. Luke Dubs and Coca RX have been a really good 2v2 yeah. duo, 4-1 and one in games, 2-0 and oh in sets. The problem is they have not been able to figure out the 1v1, and then they've been out firepowered in the King of the Hill set. So the big question is, will Hen and Kava or Surge TS be able to overcome whichever head-to-head -head 1v1 superstar comes out in the second set? And so far, that's been the big problem for the boys yeah, in Yeah, because it's been Air Surfer going 2-1 on Hen and Kava, Lapakati going 2-1 on Surge TS. So we'll see who comes out today in that. But first up, we've got Team Queso coming out today with the ban on the minor. And of course, that is Benny and Coochie, the old school throwback to 28. Team, their dominant 2v2 squad, and of course, on the other side of it, the two guys that you just talked about, Luke Dubs and Coca RX, who were banned Giant Skeleton, and they have been playing great in that 2v2 set. They've already taken down, of course, uh, <clears throat> Razor and Dip, and uh, I don't know, you know, AC and RF. Let's go ahead, jump into game number one. Coochie and Benny, bottom of your screen, Luke Dubs and Coca RX for Pain Gaming at the top. And, uh, you know, typically when we talk about stats, Andrew, we talk about players being uh, with 10 games or more to give a good enough picture, right? A good enough yeah. overall uh, set of data set. Coca RX at 4 and 1, 80% win rate. If you take that out of the equation, he currently has the best career win rate of any active 2v2 player in CRL West. Yeah, Coca and uh, Jupiter King having that, uh, that nice little bit of being a rookie here at CRL West, uh, being able to really stack their numbers for the season. So Battle Healer, left-hand side for Luke Dubs and Coca. Very interesting to see what direction they might be going here in game yeah, one. Yeah, Battle Healer, a card that we see mainly coupled with the Elixir Golem, but Elixir Golem has been uh, not super successful in the 2v2. Yeah, one and one here at CRL and in other competitions has had its challenges. Uh, so we'll see if they're going that direction. Could be going Ram Rider potentially as well. Yeah, it looks like Coochie and Benny might be going back to Graveyard, but we'll have to see a lot of parts of it so far. Minor banned, Giant Skeleton banned, but keep in mind, two things that are not banned. If you've seen one of them, the Poison, Tornado. So you have to expect that all three, or both of these teams, have at least one spot for Tornado somewhere in there, especially uh, with all the splash damage you see yeah, on the board. absolutely. Really nice skeleton surround, Hill Spirit to come in, mitigate 100% of that damage and make a very, very nice plus uh, two trade there by from Benny and Coochie. 
Coca does not have the deepest experience level in competitive play. Big standout moments in Key Lash Season 2 with Team Pelon Army getting 10th place, so a rough go there. And then a solid Audi making the top eight at the Moreno Cup 5 last year. But of the players on the board, most of whom did started competing back in 2017, Coca's not just a rookie here in CRL, but generally a rookie to competitive play. Yeah, and wow. Coca and Loop Dubs putting up a massive push. They started with some Mega Knights, Dark Prince in the back, and they are selling out in the left-hand lane, especially with that battle healer behind. However, Benny and Kuchi having little to zero difficulty stopping that push. 1934, bottom left-hand side of your screen. Now Mega Knight high, healthy Baby Dragon, and Musketeer behind, Graveyard yep. in. And do we get a tornado to pull things together on top of the princess? No, we do not. Coca, or I mean, Kuchi and Benny playing a little bit more passive here as they see a massive counter push coming in. And the other graveyard, a graveyard in return here from Pain. So, Battle Healer Graveyard for Pain Gaming. You know, you see this often with Night Witch, but haven't seen her in the mix yet. Here we go. Double Elixir Time, Sudden Death. And there comes the freeze for Team Kason. Yeah, and Pain Gaming did a great job recognizing that the, the poison was out of cycle there on the bottom left-hand side. They go in for a massive, massive blow, and they get a lot out of their poison value plus log. But then Benny Hu and Kuchiku respond and do the exact same thing. Ice Wiz and Baby Dragon with the snowball for the defense. Freeze is not going to be enough to create too much damage here. They will take the lead, but not by a lot. And now it's just trading blows yep. back and forth. Who will land the final one? A minute 20 left in and game. And Benny and Kuchi have to play hyper aggressive here because you know that's exactly what Luke Dubs and Coke are going to do. They're going to play things very, very high, not allow anything to cross the river, and take any counter push they can get to put it on tower. Second graveyard down. Freeze still available. Snowball in. Won't need the freeze. GG. Well played, Team Queso. Takes game number and I know one. this is going to sound crazy, Rich, but that's their first game, period. Game one today, game one as a team in the 2v2. Otherwise, like I said before, it's just been Ruben picking up one game in the 1v1. So a massive, massive win here for Team Queso with that first game. And also a huge turn in their confidence with Benny and Kuchi coming back out. Well, it's, you know, one thing I want to bring up in, in this problem they've had for Team Queso is the guy that we just saw win it for Tribe Gaming. Team Queso had Azealia's on the team last yeah. year. That's where he became this 2v2 standout. And now you have the best 2v2 player currently active in CRL West, who you let go, and what set's giving you the most trouble? It's 2v2. So Team Queso really hoping that this old school duo can turn things around for Yeah, them. and I think that's a really important thing for you to bring up. Dropping someone as strong as Azilius, who has really, really shown that, yeah, he's not maybe the head-to-head -head guy that he used to be, but 2v2 is so important in CRL. You talked about No Tilt favoring Team Queso, but we're not there. We're in CRL, 2v2 is a thing, and Queso is really, really struggling. So now seeing Benny and Kuchi coming back out in that set, We've seen them struggle before together. You know, we saw them come out in the fall and it didn't really work out. So maybe they've put in some extra time, they've readjusted, and they're ready to come out here now in the spring in 2020 and help Queso make playoffs. Tower down left-hand side there in the replay. And there you have the first 2v2 game win this season. And, of course, Team Queso wants a win today. Payne wants a win today. But because of the situation with wins and losses and how great Space Station and Misfits have been so far. Even a loss today doesn't eliminate either one of these no. teams. So, you know, it's a big question of like where the pressure actually exists, but you do want to have as much of your fate in your own hands as possible. So a big first step in that direction, courtesy of Coochie and Benny for Team Yeah, Kansas. I think that pressure just, I mean, look at this, yeah, look at these teams. Right here, SK. They're not playing this weekend. They've got a ton of pressure as well. They're the other squad that's in that bottom rung, which is crazy to think that if one of these squads goes 0-3, they're not eliminated because of the champions, because of them. That's one of the reasons why they're still in the running. So Group B has just been surprises all season long, and I guess that's a little bit of something to hold on to today. If you want to like talk yourself into a silver lining going, even if we lose, we're not eliminated, but this still feels like a must-win match for Payne or Queso. Well, let's go ahead and jump into game number two of the 2v2 and see if Coca RX and Cody Go can right the ship after a, a close back and forth, a slobber knocker, if you will, 
in game number one. Or uh, Luke Dubs. Luke Dubs, there we go. Luke Dubs in his fourth season in CRL. Started off with Red Canids in CRL Latin America, where he had a career, uh, a season win rate overall of 64%. Was a big star there in CRL Latin, and then just has not found the same rhythm in West quite yet. Although this season has been pretty good for him in the 2v2, obviously. We'll see if they can get game number two. So this is really interesting. It looks like Luke Dubs and Coca might be running the same thing back. You see the first three cards played, the Battle Healer, the Skeletons, and the Musketeer. And when that Musketeer comes down with the Battle Healer, Benny Hu and Kuchi go, all right, we're going to Golem right into that lane. You know, Andrew, I do wonder how much the 2v2 Goleming opening play has maybe influenced or inspired Oh, look at that. The, the freeze comes in. NATO log cleans up the the graveyard. So so nice play by Team Queso. I was, I was saying that uh, because you have so many cards and your teammate has full elixir defensive capabilities, Golemine first play in 2v2 has always been something that's fine. It's not, you're, you're not running too much risk. And I wonder if that... This deck is them recognizing the graveyard was most likely going to be the win condition. They knew that their opponent couldn't sell out on the right-hand lane with getting a tank and a graveyard down. They knew they were going to have to defend the golem, so that's a really, really nice recognition there by Benny and Kuchi. I still am slightly opposed to the golem first play, but the problem is you'll see so many YouTube videos of so many pros that will, like, make joke golem first play videos that work. Yeah. So here's, a, here's where that battle hero starts wow. to get value yep. when you stack up troops. Clogging the lane a fair bit, but now the Golem double prince trying to push on through. Strong defense from Luke Dubs and Coca RX. Yeah, a really, really nice use of that Royal Delivery at the end. It seemed like there was going to be a lot crossing the river, but that Royal Delivery does so much damage when it comes in, cleans up almost everything. And uh, Luke Dubs and Coca are actually still in the lead. Golem, Night Witch, Prince behind, and Dark Prince absolutely disappears. Defensive freeze from the Brazilians. Will it be enough to hold this long enough to prevent that tower damage? Andrew, this one's starting to get some momentum. It really is, and it feels like th the problem here is that Pain Gaming really needs to put up just a little bit of pressure in the opposite lane, because what they're doing is they're turning these counter pushes, every single one of them, into a graveyard push. And yes, that might work here and there, and maybe they'll be able to get this in and have the freeze still in the barrel. But otherwise, they are giving massive counter push ability to Benny and Kuchi, who are getting a little bit of damage every single time they bring in these golems. High poison to clean up the defense of uh, the supporting troops behind. Mega Knight coming now, maybe. Wow. If they can survive this golem push, but that golem's still healthy. And we're going to get death damage on tower as well. This could be pretty close to tower down with spells as well. As yeah, well. it's done. There's no way. Golem gets on that tower with that much HP remaining. The spells are going to come in. Benny and Kuchiku doing the right thing, which is just continuing to play their golem into their opponent's counter pushes. Their opponents never try to switch lanes. And if you're playing against a deck like this, when you get into triple, double elixir overtime, all those things, the gap becomes wider. You need to get some counter lane pressure up against this golem deck. It felt like they never really could switch lanes there, yeah. Andrew. They, they were so on the back foot trying to play catch up on defense. You know, you start spending enough elixir for a viable graveyard in the opposite lane, and you're basically saying, here, take my tower. Yeah. And that was the pressure from Coochie and Benny. So GG well played, a clean 2-0 to open things and up. The biggest thing was... We're going to jump into some of that action right yeah, now. Yeah, the biggest thing is they didn't have a great building to pull that... Uh, Golem to the center of the map, right? It was that Goblin Cage, so you see at the very, very end of the game, and I'm not sure if it's this push or not, uh, you'll see a Lightning come in. Yep, it's this. It cleans up the Goblin Cage, cleans up the Goblin Brawler, lets that Golem go straight to tower. 1,300 HP remaining, but you've got a 90% HP Golem on your tower. Those swings are brutal, and then as you said on broadcast, that death damage coming in, there's no way you can stop it. Now, it's easy for me to sit up here and go, they need to go opposite lane, but as you said, Benny and Kuchi made it very difficult, very, very difficult to pay any attention with their elixir anywhere else. And now this puts Pain Gaming in a very difficult spot. Of course, being a set down is always hard, but you now have to win 
at minimum, four games over a combination of Ruben and JP, five games overall against Team Queso to win this match. And that's a tough, tough order, but especially trying to get those four games off of the two head-to-head superstars. Yeah, and you know Team Queso, they're the type of squad, they never, ever give up. They have up and down seasons, yes, but you know they have a massive support squad behind them. And right now, knowing what you said before they started this match, they can still make playoffs. They are going to take this set. I feel it. I'm looking into the future. I know it. I'm not sleeping on pain gaming by any means, but this feels like the moment for Queso if they want to do what everyone expects them to do. And we know they have a massive fan base. They have to take this match. They must take this 1v1 set. Yeah, they want to take this set. And keep in mind that if we get into tiebreaker situations, those set differentials become important. So it's very possible that Queso could end up 2-2 two and two. SK could end up two and two, and then now we're sitting looking at uh, those little bits of bits and pieces. So this is going to be exciting, Andrew. Uh, Ruben, a very talented young star, yeah. of course, was huge already before coming into CRL. One of the most anticipated rookies to ever come into the league, and uh, it seems like today is the day where he really cements that greatness for Team Queso when everything's on the Yeah, line. and for Pain Gaming, it does feel like the correct person to bring out is Surge TS. We've seen him play pretty, pretty well in the head-to-head. -head. Yeah. You know, he's done good in King of the Hill. He's done okay in that 1v1 set, but it does feel like he's the guy. You know, he took down RF and Basoto in King of the Hill. He did fall the lot Bacati, but he took a game off of him. So here we go. Surge TS coming out for Pain Gaming back against the wall. And you talked about it, the sophomore sensation, Ruben, coming out for Team Queso, looking to add another couple wins to his record on the season. He's got one win, but no sets yet. Let's go ahead and jump into game number one. Ruben, bottom of your screen, Surge TS at the top. The young Team Queso star has been playing competitively since 2017 and high level competitive. You just didn't see him in CRL until the fall because he wasn't 16 yet. Made the got got old enough, and uh, everyone, every Team Queso fan was just waiting. You saw them in the spring season. Every Team Queso fan was saying, "Just wait until Ruben shows up. Just wait until Ruben yeah. shows up." So, high hopes for this young man here on the professional level. And a, uh, a big time shout out to you guys hanging out with us on YouTube. I see here in the chat, people are asking, "When is the fantasy leaderboard update?" Just wait until the end of the weekend. And besides, you can't start making trades till Tuesday. So I'd say just hang out, wait till the weekend's over figure out what you want to trade Tuesday morning look at those leaderboards you'll be good to go and whatever you do don't take my advice on <laughs> fantasy because I'm doing terribly this season so he poison in response to graveyard so you can see what both sides are going with different variations more of a control splash yard for Ruben versus the archers cycle with surge TS yeah and we'll see how this ends up playing through the game because a lot of great responses to graveyards on either side, you know, archers, skellies, poison, Valkyrie, and then at the bottom of the screen, there's a lot of splash damage coming out for Team Queso's Ruben. <laughs> Reaching the midway point of regulation time, and it is Surge TS slightly in the lead. Lifetime win rate in the 1v1 set of 54%. Coming into the deck. So here we go. Surge goes, all right, let's see if I can get a little bit out of you on the left, because I'm going to give you a little bit on the right here. Poison comes down defensively, and then a attempted King Tower activation allows the Valkyrie to get one hit. And a little oops there from Ruben, chooses to take that one Mega Minion swipe on the right-hand side and start banking a bit of Elixir. Behind by one is the Team Queso star. Surge TS chooses to bank up on the opposite And I like the confidence coming out from Ruben today. He drops the oops, he goes, good luck, man, because that's hopefully all that Ruben plans on giving him today. Valkyrie tanking for the graveyard, poison cleaning off the skeletons. And the nice high Mega Minion to clear off the Ice Wiz for Surge. Honestly, that Ice Wiz turning around and taking care of those skeletons did help Ruben's defense with that Goblin Brawler. Uh, you know, obviously that splash damage just helps those two hits come in. Surge TS being very aggressive, and so far that's paying off for him. A big lead on the left-hand side, and that's going to wow. be a huge chunk of damage that Ruben gives up. Surge, this Mega Minion has been so troublesome for, for Ruben on the right-hand side. Surge TS has gotten a lot of value out of it over and over. Yeah, well, you look and you see that Ruben has really no high single-target DPS for the air. And the other thing is, is that Surge goes, look, 
I see we're both running Graveyard. My cycle obliterates yours. Between the Skellies and the Archers, with that Mega Minion played on defense time and time again, he's able to get back around to that Graveyard before Ruben can get back around to his Poison, and all the while not creating any offense at the bottom of your screen. So Surge TS playing this about as perfectly as he can with this matchup. A big potential counter push coming in. And there you go. The NATO pulls it all together. This could yeah. be a big time moment for Ruben. Baby Dragon in. Bar Barrel tanking. And look at this. Ruben is keeping the pressure on. Knows he cannot take his foot off the gas in this moment. Baby Dragon gets across. Ice Wiz doing some damage. 18 10 left hand side. Final minute approaching. Triple Elixir about to happen. And. We'll see if Ruben can keep up with the cycle currently ahead on Elixir. Yeah, the though. issue here with Ruben, though, is you see, even when he gets that massive breakthrough, is there's just not enough DPS. So Surge can get a Valkyrie up front and play these really, really high DPS units in the Archer and the Mega Minion to kind of clean up the push before Ruben's units are able to clean things up. Poison does take the Archers off and a little bit of damage opposite lane, so or opposite direction. Ruben still trying to keep high pressure and not give Surge TS an opportunity to create any offense. Poison Snowball would finish it off. Graveyard opposite direction. Does Surge TS pull the trigger offensively here? Final 30 seconds. Has to play defense. I think if you're Surge TS, you just hang out, keep playing defense. There has to be a massive amount of damage to come in for Ruben for Surge to lose this game. There you go. Surge does get the poison. Ruben gets the NATO in. Not going to be enough in time. The high Valkyrie from Surge TS recognizing that he was in a bit of a base race there. The Tornado trying to help out, but the high Valk keeps that tower alive, turns all the troops away, and Surge TS takes a big game one off of Ruben. So Surge did a great thing of recognizing early on what his opponent was playing and keeping up the pressure going, look, all right, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to win this game, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to punish you with my cycle. We both recognized how aggressive he was going early on with his Valkyrie plus pushes, Valkyrie plus Graveyard, Valkyrie plus Skellies plus Graveyard, whatever it was. Then when it got into double elixir time and Ruben was able to keep up with the cycle a little bit better, Surge goes, okay, you can keep up with my cycle, but you cannot keep up with the amount of damage that I do. And that's why Surge would win every single one of those bridge battles. The Mega Minion was the ace up the sleeve, as you said. Let's go ahead and jump into some of the action from that last game and take a look at just the little pieces that Surge TS had. And you mentioned the Mega Minion, and it's the it's high it's single target DPS he's able to use, and he used it as essentially a sniper mm -hmm. on that Ice Wiz over and over again, and occasionally on the Baby Dragon as well. And it was just again very very nice defensive construction from Pain Gaming's head-to-head -head player. Yeah, I love that I love that term, using it as a sniper because that's exactly what it was. A sniper coming in, doing massive single target DPS, and of course, that Valkyrie, because of the lack of high DPS from Ruben, that Valkyrie can just get dropped up high. Look at that, five units, excuse me, four units focusing on the Valkyrie, and they are all stopped for at least a few seconds. If you have even one unit in there that does more damage, a Mega Minion, a Prince, or a Musketeer, swap any of those out, you're doing better at those bridge battles, but Surge TS recognizes it. Low DPS, high Valkyrie, GG, well played. Well, you saw the NATO there trying to pull stuff into that big scrum and maybe break it off and then get damage on tower, but the Valkyrie played just outside range, just a half step behind when that NATO came down. So good timing, good placement from Surge TS, and now with a good advantage going into game two, and we'll see what Ruben has in store. I mean, this is this has uh, been a rough season so far for Ruben in, in CRL, and one for Surge TS as well. So, you know, both of them right now chomping at the bit to win this well, set. I think the biggest thing here for Team Queso is, is that they're they're wondering, who's their guy? It was supposed to be IMJP or Ruben. And, you know, as we hop into Game 2 here, it's, it's obviously Ruben in this set. But that's definitely a struggle for Team Queso, not knowing who their head-to-head -head star is supposed to be. It's almost a luxury when you look at it preseason to go, look, we got Ruben or IMJP. We're going to dominate. But now... Four weeks in, you go, I don't know who to play. Ruben or JP, neither of them are kind of putting it together. Double bait for Surge TS. Skelly Barrel met by the Hunter from Ruben. So Ruben Lifetime coming into today, 70% win rate in the 1v1 set. Dropped a bit now with his fourth career loss in this stanza to 7-4 overall career record. 
Surge TS at 14 and 11 now with that last win. So Ruben here has a lot of great responses to bait, and he should be able to get his cycle back around pretty quickly. We'll see how Surge TS is going to make his opponent make mistakes, because that is what it's going to be all about to win this game. He is for the Skeleton Barrel, and there you go. Bar Barrel for the Goblin Barrel when that comes around. So as you're talking about, Andrew, can Surge TS make him make mistakes and essentially mess with the cycle of Ruben? Yeah, so here we go. He actually goes High Prince instead of the Barrel, try to save a little bit of Elixir and maybe get a bit of a counter push, but I think the safer option is better in this moment, Rich. He takes a lot of damage from that Goblin Barrel, and now he's back around to not really being ahead in the cycle. He's just kind of back in the cycle that Surge wants him to be in. Well, that was a tough moment, right? When you're playing Bar Barrel against a bait deck that has Dark Goblin. Yep. Because you know you're going to bar barrel, and unless you get it perfect, and usually you won't, that dark, you're going to either be getting damage from the from the goblin barrel or damage from the dark goblin. You have to go with the goblin barrel, so tried to do something different there and maybe mitigate a little bit more and get a counter push. Didn't work out. Yeah, I mean, I think he's got to do exactly what we've seen him do, except for the only difference is it's got to be Ewiz for the skelly barrel, bar barrel for the goblin barrel, and then the skeletons have to be played high to catch that dark goblin. A nice little reset there for the E-Wiz to stun and not get taken any damage from the Dark Goblin. And Rocket Cycle now coming in on the Prince here from Surge TS as we're in the final 30 seconds a of regulation. very aggressive, but a very calculated Rocket from Surge TS. You look at the Elixir, you look at what he's got on the board with a Dark Goblin and a building still on the board, and that is a beautiful, beautiful time, beautifully played Rocket. And... Mega Knight takes out that Goblin Barrel with no effort, so three Elixir goes right into the seven of the Mega Knight. This might be a big opportunity for Ruben as we go into Sudden Death. Yeah, Ruben going to try to overwhelm the bait player now with a lot of heavy beatdown. We'll see what Surge has for him. Ruben finally switches lanes here. And that's where he has a decent amount of damage. Yeah. Look, while, while Surge TS does have the specific single tower damage advantage, at the moment, Ruben does have it in both lanes. Yeah, and that is a very, very poorly timed barrel plus barrel there. Goblin plus Skelly able to get cleaned up by just one bar barrel. Knight comes in just in the nick of time. Ruben going to ignore the Knight on the bottom left-hand side, double down on the offense in the left-hand lane. And just like that, 917 to 885, this game is getting... Very, very close, Andrew, with 75 yeah, seconds left. Yeah, that Barrel comes in late. Barbarian getting tanked for by the Mega Knight and able to get a good amount of damage in. Barbarrel back in cycle. Ruben now feels like he's starting to get control of this game. Well, now he can get back around to his defensive options so quickly. Yeah. That's the thing about Triple Elixir when your deck's a little bit heavier. He can get all the way back around fast, and we're seeing that. This Ram Rider's not going to get over to Tower, but it's going to do plenty on the Bomb Tower. And there you go, Mega Knight top. Skelly's behind, and it feels like things are starting to, to twist and surge towards Ruben. Yeah, absolutely. Surge now behind by 100 HP. Yes, he does have the rocket, but he needs to get damage on the tower, so Ruben going to do everything he can to mitigate 100% of the damage, and he is absolutely doing it. We need to see a high knight here, but that Ram Rider does not connect. Very well played by Surge. Here comes another barrel. Oh, that's in, a big barrel. Goes low, a little bit of a juice. Needs the rocket. There's the rocket. We are going to King of the Hill. Oh my word. Surge TS 2-0 sweep in 1v1. And it was that last goblin barrel played in such a, an interesting spot. Yeah. Low inside corner. Ruben goes high with it. The guessing game doesn't pay off. And Surge TS making enough room for that rocket to close out the game. Very, very well played by the Brazilian. Yeah, and you understand a lot of what Ruben was trying to do. You know, you get when you try to play those smart defenses, whether it is to get a positive elixir trade, get a better counter push, or to have something in cycle later on to support your offense. So that's why you would see, you know, Mega Knight high, Skelly's back, or you would see, you know, the the E was coming in early, or Skelly's left, you know, Mega Knight right, things like that, because he wanted to save that barrel and the poison, it just did not work out. He was able to put things together at the very, very end, but Surge TS stays ahead. Let's take a look at these final moments here. 40 seconds left in overtime. And Andrew, it really felt at this stage that like the momentum was all swinging 
towards Ruben, but it's just one small little thing. He catches this one with the bar barrel in the back, but Surge TS gets around so fast to that second bar barrel. Look, the log down, Dark Goblin down. I mean, that's seconds. And this one goes to a new spot. Bar barrel not in cycle. Goblin barrel gets on tower. Just enough for the rocket. And that's that quick cycle there in the end. Very, very well played to get around by Surge Yeah, DS. he did a great job of... I mean, I think there was only one or two misplayed barrels that entire time. There was only one instance where he actually gave Ruben a ton of value with the bar barrel taking out the gobs and the skeletons. Otherwise, it was all Surge TS in the driver's seat, but he was starting to get overwhelmed a little bit as we got into double and triple elixir time, which is why you saw him holding off on offense and just sending in barrels when he could. And, you know, Ruben was going to catch some of those, but it's pretty hard pressed to catch 100% of those. Well, especially once the bar barrel's out of cycle, yeah. right? And that's how quickly he got back onto the gob barrel. You're At that point, you're playing a guessing game. You're playing a guessing game. Where do you put your E was? Do you go high? Do you go low? And Surge TS went with a, an, an interesting location, that low inside mm -hmm. corner. You're unlikely to get all three of those goblins in that spot. Even if you play an E-Wiz an e to the back, that high right one's probably going to get a stab on tower. So uh, a good choice, and a good choice to get around to the gob barrel and not go skeleton barrel again, knowing he needed the speed on tower. Uh, rather than the drop damage, uh, attempt at the drop damage, so nicely played by Surge TS, and now we go into where you think Team Queso should have the advantage, but of course, who knows here in King yeah, of the Hill? Yeah, I mean, you don't know with the way that Surge TS has been playing lately. He's played very well in King of the Hill. He's now got his first set under his belt here with a sweep over Ruben, and I don't know. I really don't know. This was the moment I said beforehand, Excuse me, that was the set that Queso needed to take. Now in a bit of trouble, in, in my opinion. I think this goes either way. It's a coin toss at this point, but maybe it actually leans towards uh, pain gaming because of surge play in that 1v1. Yeah, just a momentum thing, potentially. So let's take a look at the rosters. And it's going to be IMJP leading off for Queso, Ruben in the middle, and Kuchiku as their anchor. So the big hitters up front trying to bloody the nose of pain gaming. And a bit of a surprise here, maybe, yeah. the rookie Coca RX in the number one spot for Pain Gaming, and then Henan Kava and Surge TS. No surprise seeing those two. Andrew, are you shocked at all by some of these choices here in this King of the Hill? A little bit. You know, Luke Dubs is at 50% in his career at 18 and 18 in games, which is it's a pretty good record. On the other side of that, Coca RX hasn't played a head-to-head -head game yet in the position you're in. You want to put him in that first spot, maybe to give him a little bit of uh, you know, a little bit of weight off of his shoulders. I, I guess we'll find out if the coach is a genius or maybe if hindsight's 2020, but it does seem odd to not have Luke Dubs in this set. Here we go, get into King of the Hill. Coca RX, top of your screen. JP at the Boblin got at the bottom. And it is Goblin Barrel Coca RX, like many of these rookies, is primarily is known as a mortar bait player, but you know if you're a mortar bait player, uh, bait's bait, you know the exact the, the idea of the principles. It looks like Coca going back to that double bait deck that's so popular right yeah, now. Yeah, looking like it. And right now I am JP showing signs of what could be a minor control deck. I am JP and Ruben. If you're oh. talk, talking about players who have 10 games in King of the Hill or more, the number one and number two win rate amongst active players in CRL West for King of the Hill. So here we go. It's going to be Minor Balloon. And Coca RX is going to have a decent amount of responses, but we'll see what happens when IMGP starts sending his Miner into the support units like the Dark Goblin of Coca RX and how well Coca defends. Miner to the back here and. Knight does a smart thing up t up high and takes out the Musketeer, keeping the DPS off. And no log available. No, there goes the log. Had to get the Ice Golem down to cycle it back into Yeah, hand. nice recognition there by Coca. So now you see he goes Skelly Barrel left-hand side. No Ice Golem in response or a log. So JP going to have to get a little bit more creative here. He goes Snowball. And that's nice for JP. Snowball for the Skelly Barrel, log for the... And he can he can vary those two if he needs to. He'll take a little bit of damage potentially from the Goblin Barrel if he uses the Snowball over the log, but two small spells, good answers to both of the baits, and also a positive trade on both of those yeah, as well. Yeah, the other thing that you look at too is, you know, we talked about maybe some of the difficulty that uh, Ruben would have had in that last game getting on top of the Dark Goblin, but not going to be the case now with the Goblins and the Ice Golem. So a ton of responses to all of the bait from Coca. And here we go. Balloon high, bomb tower in response. Miner goes to the back and... Skelly's trying to predict the miner maybe getting on the bomb tower to get it off the board. Instead, they miss. Snowball comes in. And that's going to be a connection from the yeah. balloon. 
Oh, it does not. Goes down just a second with the help of that Dark Goblin Bomb. Death damage does go off. That Snowball that comes in from IMGP almost allows it to connect, but not as lucky as he would have liked. And wow. Dark Goblin does get on the tower left-hand side. That's a lot of damage here. So the lead for JP just evaporating there in those moments. I mean, that is why the Dark Goblin is and will always be one of my favorite cards in the game. So menacing, so much damage, so easy to deal with if you get there in time. And so you see the snowball had to be played on that last Goblin Barrel, meaning that there was a little bit of damage coming in, and now Snowball not in cycle has to use the log for the Skeleton Barrel instead. No, Snowball back around. I Trying to keep track of this one can be challenging. JP has so many answers here to Coca, but just barely in the lead. And you see there Coca now going with the quick log to try to pick up the goblins. Offset by the by just one tile to the right. It's played by JP, mitigates a lot of that damage. So Snowball does make it a bit of room. Last Skeleton does survive. 730 right hand side. And both these decks get around so quickly. You see, there's a little bit of chip coming in from Coca on the left-hand side, knowing that he does want to get into Rocket Cycle range with the final triple Elixir Piri coming up very soon. And he's going to have to stay so aggressive with these balloon kills. Not the balloon pushes from JP, but to take the balloon off the board, Coca needs to make sure that zero death damage comes in for the rest of this game, but really in a tough spot. 562 right-hand lane for Coca RX, 12-29 on the left-hand side for JP. Final minute, triple elixir. And Coca recognizing that there was no way for him to stop this push on the right-hand side. He tries to sell out on the left with that high Dark Goblin plus, but he knows it's just a really, really rough matchup. JP in a great, great spot, the deck that he chose, putting Coca on bait, double bait, and uh, every answer there, my friend. Yeah, there seemed like there were a couple of opportunities, but JP able to get around so quickly and even had me fooled a couple of times with which small spell was in Cycle Coca trying to find a way through, but JP always had the correct answer available, was only out of place a couple of times, and Coca not able to press the advantage. JP and uh, that whole Team Queso squad with a good choice here in well, game. Well, you've got one response to the air units, right? You've only got one card in your entire deck that can do damage to the air other than the rocket. So... That's not going to be the best option. You're probably not going to have that elixir in your hand every single time. On the other side of it, you got JP, who has every answer. He's got the log, he's got the snowball, he's got the goblins and the skeletons. The cycle can get around very, very quickly. That's a pretty hard counter. The Coca RX actually played pretty decently, but IMGP losing that game would have been a big, big misstep. Because the other thing is, is he could get that miner on tower time and time again. There's only two cards in the deck for Coca that can catch the miner, and one of them is the skellies. Yeah, you can see there that didn't catch the skellies this time, but uh, or maybe did catch it that time. The snowball able to get in there and help out with the miner over and over again. Here we go, miner snowball immediately making room. And so it's not just that you have so few cards that can catch it, it's that when he wants to guarantee damage on the tower, he can. Yeah. And that's what we saw there in the final moment. JP getting around quickly, and we've seen miner muskaloon in a lot of uh, varieties, but... This one was the perfect one for this match. Yeah, and that's, that's one thing that you, you know you're in a great spot. If you can guarantee damage every single time from not a spell but a troop unit, something like a miner, that's really tough. That immediately shows inherently that you have just a little bit of a good matchup advantage. So JP in a great spot of going, look, I'm going to get minor chip damage when and where I can for the entire game, and then those balloons will come in just to cause pressure, just to cause pressure and make you make mistakes. So that balloon coming in at the very end, it became a, a look. You can pick to defend, or you can pick to try to take my tower. But either way, you're going to lose this game. Yeah, and, and that's a, a good point there, Andrew. The, the talk about pressure, right? That that balloon is forcing responses out there and forcing more than just the bomb tower being spent. So you, every mm -hmm. time that balloon comes in, you saw that Coca was having to spend more on defense than that balloon was spending on offense. So you mix that in with the different minor placements, and uh, JP loved that back low tower over and over again. And you have a Team Queso win in game number one. And coming up next for Pain Gaming, Hen and Kava, who lifetime positive win rate in King of the Hill, 53%, and more importantly, two sweeps over his career. 
would love to make a third one in this season. Yeah, and then the last thing to say about that defense is that every single time it's a negative trade, whether it's Bomb Tower plus Dark Goblin or that rocket coming in, you need to drop something else on the back end. So really well played by IMGP, even better matchup there for IMJP. Let's go into game number two and see if Hen and Kava can even things out for Pain Gaming. And Hen and Kava going minor goes to the safe spot. Easy call there with the Knight for JP. Some. And maybe Hennen going with a note from his opponent's book, copy deck potential. Yeah, looking like it. Or no, maybe looking more like it could be minor control, but we'll see here in just a moment. And there you go, it is Balloon going with the Hunter yep. instead of the Musketeer. And Hunter just gets a little bit of splash damage on that tower, and a high barb hut comes out for I am JP. So very, very interesting. With the Barb Hut, I believe the last time we saw the Barb Hut in a deck was with the Golem, but we actually never saw it played that game. Yeah, I mean, you could see it going that direction. You could, you could see it going at Graveyard, potentially, but this feels more like Golem with the Knight. We'll see as time goes on. But Baby Dragon High picks up the bats. Yeah, seven Elixir spent on a nice five push there, so Henenkava doing the correct thing and making his opponents spend more on defense, seeing that it is a heavy deck so far. First minute and a half away, Henenkava with a slight lead, just a bit of chip damage on that left-hand side. A well-played Skelly surround by JP. Henenkava's personal best on ladder, 8,005. I am JP, only 8.6. Wow. 86.12 for the golden-haired golden boy from Barcelona, Spain. <sighs> it's okay, there's, there's people in... Oh, and look at this. What's that? Oh, I was gonna say Musketeer going out of range of the balloon, yeah. so the bomb, the the barb hut has to come down. But this is a pretty solid push for Henning. That's yeah, a lot of elixir spent that IMG IMGP is not gonna get a ton out of on the left hand side. Gonna be very very easy to counter all of this with just the hunter. So IMGP decides to double down on his mistake and poison out the hunter. I don't know if that's gonna do what he thinks. It was good recognition by Henan Kava. He knew that the delivery was cycled in the back, so it was not available on defense for that first balloon. Wow. The Musketeer went to the right-hand lane, and look at this. That's going to be a huge amount of damage. Tower essentially down now. And Henan Kava just completely took advantage of maybe some errant cycling by JP. Yeah, and that, I mean... I think IMGP was still like, look, I got this in the bag. I can defend this no problem. Musketeer high, Royal Delivery right behind, but just not the case. That balloon was on the map forever and somehow gets that big time drop at one HP. Here comes the graveyard and Hanenkava needs to play some defense here, turns things around the same way we saw Surge TS against graveyard, keep the attention at the bridge. Hanenkava does it and gets one for Pain Gaming. And man, I don't know if we can pick that up on the replay, but it really felt like that was just some, uh, some a little bit of knowing you're against Balloon, just a little bit of errant cycling there with the, the Royal Delivery in the back. Your Musketeer goes opposite direction. Two of your primary counters for Balloon now no longer available, and the, the Barb Hut didn't pull the Balloon close enough for the Musketeer to aggro. <laughs> It's been so interesting with IMJP because one of the things that we loved the most about him, we kind of revered him for, was his boom or bust play. The problem is, is I feel like the game and his opponents have evolved so much that, yeah, you can still go for those boomer bust plays, but IMGP finds himself time and time again overspending, not getting enough out of it, and then having zero response on defense. So I don't know exactly what it is, but he needs to find the happy middle ground there between being aggressive and being over aggressive. So here we go. This is the, the second balloon of that final sequence where the balloon does just barely connect. That's huge. Bats come in behind and just enough room and just a couple of miscalculations from JP. And this is one of the things about this graveyard deck is that Barb Hut can be super duper annoying, but it's also seven elixir. It's hard to get it down in time the way you want it as a response. And 
Uh, you know, it's one of those things where, especially in this matchup, maybe you should only be playing it when you're up on Elixir. Yeah, definitely. Because every single time that JP played his bar putt, it was almost in desperation defensively, uh, other than maybe the very, very first one. So not really getting what he needed out of that bar putt. And you talk about a card that costs seven elixir. That's really, really crippling your your cycle, right? If you've got a seven elixir card in your hand that you never really want to comfortably play, and the only time you do play it is to make negative trades, that's just that's just trouble. That's going to be trouble all game long. So Hanan Kava gets game number one for Pain Gaming. Uh, we're going into our third game of the set, and of course, coming up next is Ruben for Team Queso. So you go from amongst players with 10 or more games in King of the Hill, from the number one player in JP to the number two player in yep. Ruben, and right now, both of those guys at just under a 70% clip in this set. This would be a couple of big heads for the wall of Henan Kava. Yeah, 150%. Ruben sitting at 69% in King of the Hill. And, of course, IMGP with that loss now just dropping below 70, probably around like 67% or so. Kuchiku, last up, 59%. So all of them looking pretty good. But here we go. Henan Kava, Ruben, let's do this. So this one a little slower start. It's been a lot of fast cycle in the head-to-head -head play so far. And both these guys looking in the eye and maybe waiting for the other to make the first move. Henenkava started his or his big his first big competitive win was at MGL Worlds in 2018, where Brazil took first. And of course, that same year at CR Nations, Brazil took first place as well. So when wearing his country's colors, Henenkava has been stellar, trying to turn that into success here in CRL as well. And for those of you guys in the YouTube chat that are wondering, why are Rich and Andrew saying Henan? Well, my friends, that is actually the way that it's pronounced in Portuguese. The Brazilians speak, and we got a little bit of help from our friends Bruno and Deco to let us know. But my goodness, what is happening in the top right-hand side of the screen? And that's a whole lot of damage. That would be a skeleton, giant skeleton bomb and a balloon bomb. Death, death. And that's almost death on the tower. Hanan Kava's Royal Giant Cycle in trouble early against Ruben. Yeah, that is not how you want to start this game off. You see he goes aggressive on the left-hand side, hoping that Royal Giant's going to do exactly what that Balloon plus Giant Skeleton did on the right-hand side, but just not the case. So now Hanan Kava in an uphill battle for the rest of this game. And a little minor chip there, and he should have plenty to deal with the, the Prince. Giant Skeleton high, wow. Hunter low, and this is going to be a nice defense for Ruben. I mean, that is just so much massive single target DPS here coming out from Ruben. And ahead by one elixir, although has taken a bit of chip damage here. 1518 on the left, so about 1,000 HP. 1,004 to be precise as we go into double elixir time. And Ruben just goes ahead and look at that. The prediction bats on the firecracker. And the miner tries to go low for the e -Wiz. Doesn't get it, but... That's going to be just close enough for death damage. Nice sequence there from Ruben. Yeah, nice sequence from Ruben. Now down to 242 in that top right-hand tower. Hen and Kava going to sacrifice the tower, most likely. I mean, he plays those skeletons because he sees the plus one trade, but he needs to double down here on offense. He needs to get this world giant in, but the biggest problem for him is, is how does he take care of this hunter? Well, I'll tell you, he's probably going to use some spell value. And the giant skeleton holding the prince high. Royal Giant gone. And that's some cheap expenditure yeah. on the right-hand side for that e -Wiz as well. Yeah, I mean, Ruben right now just playing this absolutely perfectly clean. No way for Hen and Kava to break through. And, you know, the amount of responses coupled with that Giant Skeleton, that Royal Giant was basically useless for that entire game. Yeah, the Giant Skeleton with the Hunter behind, Andrew. We saw that sequence done a couple of times and trying to load up. Look. You spend 11 Elixir on that side just between the, the Royal Giant and the Prince alone, and you feel like this has to do something, anything, please. But Ruben able to just go, no, Giant Skeleton high, so that's even the Hunter for four. You're, you're, you're making a plus one trade there on that side and playing pretty much unbreakable defense. Yeah, I mean, the toughest thing here for Hen and Kava is putting together a big enough push to come across the river while saving enough elixir to defend against the balloon, but also he needs to protect his royal giant. It was There was just no way to get around all of those things because you can't just fireball log 
the, the hunter off the board, right? Because then you've only got the firecracker E is to deal with the balloon on the right hand side, but you need to support the royal giant. It, it, there was just it felt like there was no way for Hen and Kava to actually break through in this game. Yeah, it, it was it was brutal and the the offensive sequences put together by Ruben also taking advantage. You saw the the bats predicting on the uh, on the yeah, firecracker, yeah. the miner was trying to catch the E-Wiz. The E-Wiz goes high. Still ended up being a devastating push either way. And Ruben was just a good deck choice and one step ahead the entire way. And now, one win away from a King of the Hill sweep and a very important first team queso match victory. Yeah, and the giant skeleton really was the, the... It was the giant skeleton plus the hunter that became just this unstoppable defense every single time at the river. And giant skeleton is such an interesting card because I, I struggle playing it, but when you watch pros use it, it is just the best defensive card in the game, it seems, time and time again. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny. You, you rewind to about a year and a half ago, and the idea of Giant Skeleton being viable competitively was almost laughable yeah. to a certain degree. It was not being played in head-to-head -head play back in 2018 and was barely being played. And people, when people figured out the value it had in 2v2, even without Tornado, suddenly people were looking at that going, hey, like this is pretty good. Uh, it was working with Graveyard mm -hmm. a bunch, helping out in bridge battles. And the next thing we saw, suddenly, hey, it was the, the Graveyard deck with Giant Skeleton mixed in. And suddenly, Giant Skeleton is everywhere all over the meta. It just took someone cracking the code. Yeah, you know, we also saw it with Clone for a long time, too, when there was that crazy Giant Skeleton clone deck that was out there. But here we go. Surge TS going to play the hero for his squad once again, hoping to take down Ruben and Kuchiku in these next two games. But right now, it's him and Ruben going head-to-head -head once again after that 1v1 set where Surge TS came out on top uh, emphatically. So here we go, Ruben, bottom of your screen, Surge TS on top. Can the Team Queso player get revenge? And of course, a very important first win for his team. I don't know, chat, let us know. Would not be the sweep, just to clarify. I forgot that uh, the JP won the first game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chat, who do you got? Let us know. Let us know in that YouTube chat. You got Payne, you got Queso. This is a big one. So again, a slow start this time out. And after the the pace put on during the 1v1 set, this is a pretty big change. First minute away, no one's blinked yet. Yeah. Pressure's on, man. You don't want to you don't want to make that first misplay as your first card played. You can see a lot of uh, those 70 Spectators, my guess is that's all the the other CRL players on these accounts for the game for our CRL Spring Edition. Chat is blowing up right now as we're sitting here waiting for the first card to be played. And, and I'll be honest, man, it, it actually looks pretty even here between Surge and Ruben, just going back and forth and back and forth. People saying maybe it's lava. He's leaking, man. Yes, yes, they are, bo they are both leaking. <laughs> What's that? What is that? Well, it's uh, just the elixir, you know, hanging out. 22 now on the board. <clears throat> Excuse me, 35 now on the board. My vision is not what it used to be. Final 10 seconds of regulation. Here we go. Should see a play in just a moment. And a zap. So that's the big move. Everything we've been waiting for. So... So Surge TS goes Sparky and Dark Prince opposite lane for yep. And Dark Plinth plus Baby plus Barb Barrel. Wow. That is... And this is looking pretty good for Surge TS it right sure now. It sure is. It really, really is. You see that high Goblin Page being played on the right side to stop that Sparky. Giant comes down, goes straight on through to Tower, and there's so much behind. And the Sparky still connects wow. on the right-hand side. A slight miscalculation by Ruben. And this is going to be a quick GG well played. Surge TS going to blow him out of the water here in game number four. We're going to game five, King of the Hill, folks. This is the back and forth battle we'd hoped for. And it's going to come down to Surge TS and Kuchiku for everything. Wow. 
that is a that is one you wish you could get back if you're Team Queso or if you're Ruben. You wait that long to just get dominated by two misplays. And you know what? That's exactly what Pain Gaming needed. Surge TS plays for a minute there. He gets the W. Now we're back to even. Surge on the day is 3-0. and oh. And now it's going to be someone in Kuchiku coming out, going up against Surge. And, and Kuchi, just to let you know, he hasn't played any head-to-head -head in 2020. Yeah, this will be his head-to-head -head debut this season. Of course, certainly experienced overall. More on that later. First, let's look at... Just how that one went down, it didn't take very long. Just about three minutes to get this one done, and this big attempt to go opposite lane ran right into an Ewiz, Mini Pekka, Mega Minion. Uh, goodbye, Dolly. I guess what I'm goodbye, curious tower. about here is that it seemed like Ruben had an idea of how he wanted to defend this, and the idea was the Goblin Cage to stop that Sparky on the right-hand side. But what's weird to me about that is that you see the Sparky come down as essentially the first card played by Surge TS other than that Zap. And you have to imagine that a Goblin Giant or a Giant is probably going to be coupled with that. Yes, we've seen other combinations, but for the most part, you see a big tank with that Sparky. So if you play your Goblin Cage high on the right-hand side, you're basically sacrificing the left-hand side. And as you said, that Sparky still got a shot on the right. So I'm not exactly sure what Ruben's idea was defensively there, but it definitely didn't work out the way that he'd hoped. Yeah, that, that was a rough one. And again, you, 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 you'd cycle the zap and then, boom, Sparky immediately behind. So it's a, a lot of elixir to open up. And maybe Ruben said, hey, he just spent eight. Let me just try to push hard the opposite lane. But when that whole push just wilted on the vine on the left-hand side and was completely consumed, it left him way behind on the board, way behind on Elixir, and suddenly without a tower on the left-hand So lane. talk to me a little bit here about Kuchichu, because this is a guy that's got a 59% win rate in his entire career. He's 64 in the 1v1 set. King of the Hill, he's 10-7 and 7 in games. Uh, but this was a guy that kind of surprised us back in 2018 in AEU when he came out and he did have some nice head-to-head -head moments. He was 9-3 and three back then, just for reference. Yeah, 4-0 in the best of three 1v1 sets. Didn't play a ton of King of the Hill because, again, back in 2018, like this season, King of the Hill was the third and final set. You know, he he was he played a lot of head-to-head -head play in that season, but that was back when Team Queso really was mixing things up a ton, yeah. maybe even more than they have these days. I mean, you never knew who would come out in any set at any moment that 2018 season where Queso won uh, the European Regional Championship. Since then, he's been primarily a 2v2 player, and I know it's, it hasn't been as much head-to-head -head play, but still, overall, as you said, a lot of success here. Kuchiku is really experienced. Back to 2017, winning RPL Europa with Team Queso, or getting, I'm sorry, getting fourth place in that season. 2018 again in SLO, so he's been competitive for a long time, and it's hard to, when you talk about being someone who's competing at this level, it's hard to replace that amount of experience. Yeah, 100%. You know, when we talked to the, the coaches and the owners of Team Queso when we were in Tokyo, they told us, like, look, the thing about our guys and Benny and Kuchi is that they have more experience than almost anyone on live stages. People just forget because they're not these big knockout hitting superstars. They just kind of fly under the radar and, and win. Double bait for Surge TS. And does a good job defending this big push. So timing really, really nice here on that gar God Barrel plus Skelly Barrel gets a ton of damage in. Surge in lead by about a thousand. Kuchi puts out a laugh here, but not a lot to laugh about for Team Queso right now. Musketeer does get a couple of shots on that left-hand side, 1971 to 1263 as we cross the halfway point of the first three minutes. And just to clarify what I was saying earlier, I accidentally read his 2v2 games after you said his 1v1 sets. So 1v1 sets, 4-0 oh in 2018, which he said, but it's 8-1 in games, which is where my mistake came in. 8-1 in head-to-head -head play in that 1v1 set was Gucci Q. Yeah, I mean, he was phenomenal in all phases. And here we go, tons of rocket value on that left-hand side. Gets the giant gets the Sparky off the board and still gets a little bit of damage as well. And you see the white flag being wo uh, waved by someone in the crowd. Yeah, I mean, Surge TS there, the only thing that could have been better for him in that sequence is that that rocket came down a half second earlier, was able to stop that Sparky shot from hitting his knight, but honestly doesn't matter. Sitting at 871, he is so close to just rocket cycling this out, but he doesn't need to. He can wait for these Skelly Barrel drops coming in. He can try to get the damage with the God Barrel and then send in the rocket when he knows he's going to win the game. 
Now Giants in both lanes, Mini Pekka behind the Giant on the left hand side and on the right hand side. So quite a lot to deal with for Surge TS in this moment. Bomb Tower pulling it all to the middle and a second Bomb yeah. Tower should be sufficient to do the defense here on the right hand side. Has to deal with this Musketeer and the Skellies will yeah, do it. Yeah, Skellies coming in, the death damage from the tower gonna do it. Goblins on and just like that, Surge TS goes perfect on the day for Pain Gaming. Wow, <laughs> there you go. Give it a full one, four and O oh on the day. Beautiful play from Surge TS and this one was just a rough matchup for Coochie Coo top to bottom. No great response here for the bait cards, especially that Goblin Barrel. And then of course the rocket for the Sparky means the Sparky itself is almost perfectly neutralized. And then you add in the value of the rocket on both the Giant and the Sparky on that left hand side. And this was all Surge TS pretty much all the way. Yeah, and this is kind of where we go back to that conversation we were having at the very, very beginning of the day when I was talking about, or excuse me, the beginning of this match, when I was talking about Pain Gaming having 23 crowns as opposed to Queso only having three crowns. You see that they get swept in the 2v2, but what they've already done so far in the 2v2 this season gives me a little bit of faith, right? Maybe they had an off day, maybe they had bad matchups, maybe they just misplayed. But what they did today in head-to-head -head play, Coca picking up his first win and Surge TS going 4-0, and oh, that's massive for Pain Gaming. They were already doing well in the 2v2 set, now today picking up that 1v1 prowess that they need. Pain Gaming could be a threat still if they make it to playoffs. Yeah, I mean, and, and they have as good a shot as anybody now at 1-2 and two overall in the season. They get themselves to 2-2. Two and two. They are certainly in the mix for that number three spot or even number four mm -hmm. if Misfits loses to Space Station tomorrow. So still so much to be decided in Group B and Pain Gaming with this win make the, put themselves right in the yeah, mix. Yeah, and I think, again, this is a big moment for Pain. They just stick what they got in 2v2. You have Surge play that 1v1. You can move things around in King of the Hill, see how Luke Dubs is feeling, or see how Coca's feeling. They both are able to pick up wins in that third and final set, so if they're able to put it together in the 1v1, as they've shown, I think Pain Gaming becomes a much more dominant force because of what they've already done in 2v2. It's not easy to 2-0 AC and RF, and they did that, showing that that 2v2 squad can take down anyone. And well, and then you, you, if you mix in Surge TS doing what Payne had always hoped for him to do, yes. which is play in CRL the way he's played in other competitions. If he can do that, Payne Gaming gets really, really dangerous. And I would certainly be afraid coming into this last week uh, if, I'm, if I'm their opponents and my season is on the line. And uh, that's going to be a tight one going into our final So weekend. here we go. Group A, two squads now at 3-0. One in Group A, one in Group B. Tribe Gaming at 3-0 for Group A. Dignitas, 2-1 and one after that loss today. CRB at 1-1. One and one. Actually still completely in the running for first place is Cream Real Betis. Team Liquid at 1-2 and two, and Chivas Esports playing tomorrow looking to finish out the regular season with a win. They need that win like yesterday. Yeah, they need a lot to bounce their way if they're going to stay relevant. On the other side, Space Station and Misfits, each one of these teams completely in control of their own destiny. They will decide that tomorrow in a true match Ooh. to give us our first place for Group B. And then, of course, you just saw Pain Gaming put Team Queso really on the ropes right now. The cheesy ones desperately need a win and a few balls to bounce their way to stay relevant. Of course, their final match to be coming up next weekend is going to be against Misfits. So that's going to be a tough out for them as well. Team Queso now in a tough spot here behind SK yeah, Game. Group B, not at all what anyone expected, uh, you know, coming into the season, but that's what we love about CRL. So tomorrow, 10 a.m. on the West, 1 p.m. on the East, Chivas Esports face off against Crame, Real, Betis, and then, as you just said, the two Two undefeated squads in Group B, Space Station Gaming at 3-0, facing off against Misfits Gaming, 2-0. That is going to be a barn burner, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'm so excited for that one. The way that Misfits has looked in 2v2, of course, against ACNRF is going to be fascinating. And then the single target heavy hitters on both sides, Lapo and Samuel, yeah. Air Surfer, 
Wow! And Wings! It's going to be absolutely crazy. I cannot wait for this one. This is the one I've been waiting for uh, ever since I realized earlier this week that this is what we were coming to on Sunday. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. And guys, we wanted to thank you once again for hanging out on YouTube. I, I, you know, we did our best to interact with the chat as much as we can. We're going to work on that moving forward. But trust us, we see it. We see all the great things you say. We see all the not-so-great things you say. But... Either way, make sure you're watching us on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you got your notifications turned on. Hey, you never know. Maybe we'll answer one of your questions live on air. Another way to get in touch with us is to hit us up on Twitter. You can ask us questions there. And uh, I'm at Andrew Guy. That's at Rich Slayton. But most importantly, it's at Esports Royale EN to follow along with all the most up-to-date Clash Royale, competitive news, CRL, and otherwise. Finally, Fantasy Royale. I feel so good after my lineup set today. I'm so happy about it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to move from 10th place to 10th place and stay tied for like seven gems or whatever, but I'm still happy about it. <laughs> did you, uh, did yours pay off? I, you told me you made some switches. I did okay. okay. I did okay today. I have to go back and look at the actual numbers after this is over, but wasn't a complete disaster today as it has been <laughs> in the past. Andrew, we're coming down to the final stretch here. We have tomorrow, we have next weekend, yeah. and then that's going to be it for all these teams. Uh, I mean, any any predictions as we go into it? Is there any team that you feel is safe at this stage? All I know is that I need to... Safe? Safe to make playoffs? Yes. Safe when it comes to playoffs? No way. I think any of these top squads could put anyone else on notice. I think there's going to be massive upsets in that BO5 set when we actually do get to playoffs. So I don't know. I'm with you, though. Tomorrow is one of the biggest matchups that I've been waiting to see all season long. And I can't believe we're actually almost done with the regular season already. Yeah, I mean, this very, very quick group stage. And we've talked about it before, kind of World Cup style making every single match so important. And I've spoken with a few players uh, off stream and just the, they talk about the pressure about how crazy it yeah. is that every, th every single moment, every single match, every single game matters so much. You don't have that recovery period that we've seen some teams take advantage of in previous seasons. Yeah, and you wonder if for squads like, let's say, Chivas Esports, if they're having that just down moment that you kind of had the luxury of having before in a longer season. You could lose four matches in a row and still come out six and four, you know, or something like that, eight and four, whatever, however many matches you were playing. That's not the case anymore, and those losses, that's compoundingly brutal when it comes to your confidence. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. This has been another great day of CRL. We'll be back here tomorrow, 10 a.m. in the West, 1 p.m. in the East. For Andrew Guy, I'm Rich Slayton. Stay safe. See you manana. <laughs>